Well, good morning, West Cobb. You guys look and sound fabulous today. And I wanna just take a moment and welcome all of you to this amazing journey to freedom, uh, a journey we began just a few weeks ago toward discovering the full, abundant, victorious life that God promised us that so many of us are not aware of that's been made available to us. And I wanna, I wanna just welcome you if you're just joining us. My name is Stan Coleman, and I'm privileged to be the lead pastor of this amazing place of grace called West Cobb. And if you're new here, brand new here, or just returning to church, we're especially glad you're here. You could have not picked a more perfect day for you to arrive. Let's give it up for all our newcomers and guests today for just being here. Thank you. Hey, a bit of housekeeping today. First of all, if you are new, we don't consider you a visitor, but an honored guest. To help with that, there is a connection card in the program. There's a little place that you can fill out as much or as little as you feel comfortable with. And then later when we receive our offering, you can place this in the basket. Or better yet, you can stop by the Welcome Center and get a complimentary gift bag, exchange it for that. Hope you'll take advantage of that. Also, you picked a good day today because today I wanna to invite all of you who've never attended lunch with me to have a free lunch with me, okay? It's called Discover West Cobb. And we're gonna uh, meet together over here. And we have a slide for Discover West Cobb by any chance? Uh, today at 1215 in the lobby. Here's what's, I wanted you to see this, child care provided. We've got kid-friendly food. We've got child care for you. And we're gonna just get together. And But by the time you went out to a restaurant, ordered your food, got your food, ate your food, paid for your food, waited for your check, blah, blah, you would already have taken your next step in your journey right here for free. So learn more about our mission, vision, values, meet some of our staff, and take the next step in your journey. And plus, best of all, it's free food, all right? Also, I don't believe that God is a God of happenstance or coincidence. I actually believe that God brought you here today for a special purpose. And today, at the end of our time together, I'm gonna to ask every single one of you under the sound of my voice to take the next step in your journey toward God. What do you mean, Pastor? For some of you, this will mean at the end of our time, I'm gonna pray with you a game-changing life trajectory prayer that will change the course of your eternity at the end of our time together before we take communion. For others of you, you will decide today, not tomorrow, not next week, today, I'm gonna to finally... Uh, leave the sidelines and get on the field and get in the game. I want to be a part of this surge of momentum, this season in the life of West Cobb. I'm going to come to lunch. So when you leave, you go out these doors and take a left and come to the lobby. We got plenty of food for you. You'll take the next step and you'll partner with us in this glorious mission and movement of the gospel of freedom and grace. Others of you, uh, are gonna become obedient to something. For whatever reasons, it just hasn't been the right time or you just haven't fully surrendered to it. You're already a Christian. You know, you know it, obviously God knows it, but you've never obeyed God. And the first thing a Christian is supposed to do, which is going public with your faith by being immersed in the waters of baptism. So on Sunday, September the 9th, we're gonna have an amazing baptism service. Uh, it's gonna be one of the coolest baptisms in the history of our church, uh, and there's a significant way. We're not gonna baptize in that pool, we're gonna baptize in a different pool, and you'll be hearing more about that. But you'll sign up for that, you can do that on your connection card as well, or for some of you, today will be your day to pray that very special prayer, and you didn't know it, but you're gonna follow Christ in baptism on September the 9th as well. So what's the cool thing is that every one of us are gonna be able to take the next step in our journey. Now today, we're in week four of our journey to freedom, uh, exposing the truth that sets us free that Jesus talked about. And uh, I wanna ask and answer a single question today. How do you get past your past? How, how do you get unstuck and get past your past? We're gonna to go to a single story in the Older Testament of the Bible, and we're gonna uncover someone who had the most imperfect checkered past imaginable and find out how she somehow, someway, supernaturally by the hand of God, was able to experience a life of freedom and favor and walk in the favor of God. I'll ask it again. How do you get past your past? Every one of you have a past. I have a past. 
You have a past. We all have a past. No one is exempt from your past. And the cool thing about today is that you're going to discover your past doesn't have to define you. Your past doesn't necessarily disqualify you from your future. In fact, if you're taking notes in your outline, you are more than your past if, and that's a big if, you'll surrender your future over to God. You are more than your past if you'll learn the art of surrender. Well, pastor, let's get right to the story. Well, hold on just a second. I need you to know something in advance. This story is going to shock some of you. I'll just tell you right up front in advance, some of you who are really super religious, very churchy or Bible belty, this story might actually tick you off. And you'll discover why in a few moments. Because as I was reading the story, it caused me to blink my eyes and blush. Even as a man, as old as I am, and as grown up as I am, I've seen a whole lot, but I was once again reminded of something that God did for this woman that in our human perspective, you would think should never, ever occur. Because as I'm reading this story, and we're going to look at it in just a moment, this person had the most horrible, no good, very bad past, so stained and so notorious she was and so checkered. From a human perspective, God should have never favored her with freedom and peace and grace and a future. But we're going to discover something and learn what God did and learn from her. Really, Stan, she should have been disqualified? Well, you be the judge as we tell the story. The story is told by a man named Joshua. Joshua uh, in Hebrew is Hosea, which means savior. Uh, Joshua wrote a book by that name, and he sort of tells about the history of Israel. If you're unaware, the children of Israel were in bondage, in slavery. Uh, They were handcuffed for 400 years. Suddenly, uh, through a, a deliverer named Moses, Uh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And many of you know the Red Sea and the story and Charlton Heston, you think he's Moses. That's not actually Moses, okay? But what happened was these children of Israel, they live in the, uh, the wilderness for 40 years. What should have taken two weeks took 40 years. Some of you are so stuck in your past, what should have taken two weeks has taken 40 years. You're going around and around and around They're walking around the wilderness, and you see, if you notice something, I'm going nowhere fast, okay? Now, my trainer's here today, and he he knows I'm doing a little cardio work, and that's great, but here's what's really cool. We're going to find out how Joshua led the people into the promised land from the land, the wilderness, the land where they were, had been set free, but it didn't feel like they were free. They should have been, but they weren't. There was a huge problem right in front of Joshua. And can I tell you that I recognize today that some of you have a problem right in front of you. And I don't know exactly what your problem is. Some of us have obsessions. Some of us have addictions. Some of us have compulsions. But there was a problem that was right in front of them, and they didn't know what to do. And maybe you don't know what to do. And by the way, I just a little aside here. As we're uh, a few weeks into our freedom journey, I want to let you know something. I went and worked out once this week, and uh, early morning, and I came home, as I was driving home, I noticed, now this had obviously happened prior to this, a spider had built his web between my mailbox and the American flag that's nearby. So I could literally, as the sun's coming up and the fog is, I could see the spider web. Now that, that web may have been there for weeks or for months or for days or for hours, But for the first time, I saw the spider web. And can I tell you why? Because there was a lot of light that was being displayed on the spider web. Some of you, as we're exposing the truth, you're uncovering some rocks, we're shining the light of God's word upon some of the issues of your life. For some of us, it gets a little hard. And guess what? The enemy of freedom, Satan, the evil one, he will do anything and everything to trip you up, right? So here's what he's going to do if he hasn't already. He's gonna try to make it hard for you to join your group. He's going to make you too busy to do your daily homework and devotionals and get in God's word. Why? Because he knows if you get exposed to the truth, if you uncover that rock, if you get the light shine on that spider web, that you could actually, by God's power, have something change the trajectory of your life, that you could literally begin to live in a land of freedom and favor. So there's a huge problem right in front of you. There's a problem in front of the children of Israel, and it's, uh, it's a problem that's keeping them from freedom. And the problem in their case was a city called 
Jericho. You may not know this, Jericho was the capital city and it was the most impenetrable city in the world, the most fortified city at the time. There were literally huge, wide walls built all around the city. Also, for those of you who are history buffs, 22 of you care about this, uh, the city is 846 feet below sea level, which means it's the lowest city in the world and still is. Some of you right now have walls built up and you're feeling low. You have had issues and situations and circumstances in your life and um, you had expected one thing and gotten another and so you're down and you're disappointed and you're discouraged. There's a gap between what you expected and what you got. So there's frustration mounting. And so what you've done, unbeknownst to you, maybe you built up some walls between you and freedom and favor. And you have these walls and you're like an impenetrable force that nothing can get through your heart, your will, your mind, your soul, your body. So the one thing keeping the Israelites from living in freedom was this city called Jericho. And maybe you have your own Jericho. And so the children of Israel who really aren't trained to be a good army, they're a bunch, bunch of ex-slaves. The chances of them crossing the Jordan River, first of all, that's gonna be, how are you gonna do that? Then how are you gonna go in and capture the most fortified, impenetrable city on the planet at the time? Not gonna happen. The odds are, I'm sorry, overwhelming against you. Can I ask today, do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, man, you've got this deck stacked against you that as much as you try and as hard as you work, that you are overwhelmed with these odds against you? If you ever feel that way, guess what? You're in line for a miracle. You're in line for the supernatural favor and freedom of God, but you've got to stay and wait for it. Because in our story, Joshua, their leader, decides to send some spies in to gather information because information is power to investigate the city. How are we gonna do it? Somehow, some way, the spies make their way to a safe haven of someone who becomes a total game changer in Israel. Not just for the spies, and not just for her, but for the history and the story of all of Israel. And it's probably the last person in the city or the world that you would ever think that God would possibly use. Well, Stan, would you please get to the story? Would you just tell us the story and tell us why this person doesn't qualify? Again, you be the judge. We pick up this incredibly surprising story in Joshua chapter two, verse one. The scriptures will be on the, the slides in a moment. I'll warn you in advance, once again, if you're churchy, if you're real religious, there's some words that we're gonna use today that you're not gonna be real happy about. Here we go. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. <laughs> As the spies are investigating, somehow they find themselves in, of all places, the house of a harlot the place of a prostitute named Rahab. And as the story goes, someone sees the spies enter the house of the prostitute of ill repute, and they report it to the king of Jericho, and Jericho goes, we got these spies right where we want them. So he sends in a Jericho SWAT team to capture the spies, and the prostitute named Rahab says, hold on just a moment. It is true they were here, but at dusk, just before the gate closed, they took off. Hurry, you might still be able to catch them if you run real fast, she says. She was very subtle, very seductive, very manipulative, just as you would think a prostitute would be. But then something happens in our story. Late that night, the spies who had been covered with palm branches as these uh, SWAT team came in, so they didn't find anybody there, they're up on the rooftop, the Bible says, and Rahab decides to climb up on top of the roof and have a conversation with the spies. Wouldn't you love to have a front row seat to what it is that the spies and this harlot, this prostitute talked about? Verse nine, she says, I know, I know the Lord. Do you see how that's capitalized? That means it's the original word, Yahweh. 
I know Yahweh has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For again, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, your God, the God of Israel, is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. And friends, we have right here in scripture a prostitute proclaiming that the Lord God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has given the Israelites the land, and he is the supreme God, she says, of the heavens above and the earth below. And in doing so, listen, Rahab the prostitute is proclaiming faith in the supreme creator of the uh, heavens and the earth. And so while all of Jericho is in terror, and all of Jericho is is, um, preparing to fight against these Israeli army and the spies who'd come in, Something incredible happens, and uh, Rahab knows it's too late. Uh, She knows that Jericho is doomed. Jericho is getting ready to fall, and she knows this because the God of Israel is greater than the God of Canaan, the false God. And so in verse 12, she gets really creative and courageous. Now, Now, she says to the spy, swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us this land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only, only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. I accept your terms, she replied, and she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. In our story today, after Rahab clearly understands that Jericho is doomed, she extracts a promise, a guarantee of safety for her and her family when all is said and done. The spies gladly and gratefully comply, and they promise, we will protect you if you'll do one thing And by the way, so many of us think we've got to do 10 things or five things or even three things. Actually, sometimes God's just asking you to do one thing. And if you'll do the one thing, then you'll begin to walk in the favor and freedom where God will then give you something else you can do. But until you do the one thing, you're not where God wants you to be. The only way that the invading Israelites will know it's her home is is if she leaves the scarlet rope by which the spies climbed out of her house. As you read the story, as I read the story, one of the most important parts of this story is the scarlet rope. It's very important in our story, and it's very important in your future. And as we read the story, as you think about this, I mean, I'll be honest, all kinds of questions come to mind and doubt surface when I read a story like this. I'll be honest with you as a pastor. In fact, I have people coming to me thinking that I have all the answers. One of the things I've learned to say, and I recommend you learn to say, is three words, I don't know, okay? It's okay that you don't know, but let's, let's discover together. Let's find out together. Let's investigate together. Like you wonder how this worked out for the spies, right? The spies, they go home and they have a conversation with, hey, well, what hotel did you stay in over in Jericho? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. We stayed in the house of a harlot, a prostitute. Uh, uh, how'd that go, right? Well, we have all kinds of questions. Well, here's what we do know. We know that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho We know that as the commander general of God's great army, that Israel decided, you know what? For 40 years, all we've pretty much done is we've gone around in circles and we haven't trusted and we haven't obeyed and we haven't surrendered and we've done it our way, we've done it our way, we've done it our way and God sent us manna, fresh bread every day, but we haven't surrendered over to God. And so why don't we just do what our commander tells us to do? 
So God tells Joshua, have the people march around the city walls once a day for seven straight days. Sounds pretty weird, right? Why would we do that? But God said, this is what I want you to do. By the way, did you know that faith doesn't always make common sense? (laughs) One of my mentors from years ago, Manly Beasley said, faith is believing something is so when it's not so in order for it to be so. It doesn't always make perfect sense. When God tells you to do something, it won't always, uh, it won't always, um, how how do they say it? Uh, Complete the eye test. Because here we are marching around. It's hot. It's humid. We're sweating. We're going nowhere, right? For six days, we've done the same thing, same song, second verse, going nowhere. But we're doing what God told us to do through our leader. We tried our way. Why not give it a shot for seven days? And look what happens. On the seventh day, they were told to march around the wall seven times. On the seventh time, they were to do something. And here's what history records. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed. And the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured Jericho. Friends, this is an amazing story of the capture of the greatest, mightiest, most fortified, impenetrable city in the world at the time. Stan, what was it that collapsed the walls of Jericho? Was it the marching for seven days? Was it the ram's horn that was blasted? Was it the final shout by all the people? Actually, it was none of that. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the Bible tells us what collapsed the walls of Jericho. It's found in the book of Hebrews in the Newer Testament. And Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after the people had marched around them for seven days. After they had done what God had, after they obeyed and trusted and surrendered to God's way, not their way. What was it that collapsed those walls? I will tell you. Faith collapsed the walls of Jericho. And when they realized we've done it our way, let's trust God, let's obey God, let's surrender our lives over to God. Be honest today. Have you got some walls built up? Have you got some defenses? Man, things haven't worked out quite well for you. You should have been promoted by now. You have all your exes live in Texas or whatever it might be. I don't know what's going on in your life. Here's here's what happens. is so often we blame others. We blame God. Heck, we even blame ourselves. It's time to stop all that. You have a heart that's so impenetrable, and there's a lot of wounds from your past. It's time to get past your past. How do you do it? Well, you go to the story of Rahab, and she had all these walls built up. She was one of the most notorious sinners in the city of Jericho, and she knew it, and everyone else did. And we don't know everything that happened in her life to cause her to make these decisions. How she must have thought to herself, could God ever rescue me? How could I ever live in freedom and favor from the God of Israel like I felt when I was with those spies? I want so much more. Right now, you're stuck. Right now, your past has kind of got you wound up and stuck right where you are. How are you going to move past your past? Look with me. She, she's so excited about her future. She knows she can't stay where she is and go on with God. Joshua, uh, Joshua says, the city and everything in it is under a holy curse and offered up to God, except for Rahab the harlot. She is to live, Joshua says, she and everyone in her house with her because she hid the agents we sent. And on the story goes... Here's Joshua. You think think of the to-do list of the commander general as they're taking over Jericho, and he remembers a harlot named Rahab. Look at verse 22. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. The men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, all the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. That would have never, ever happened for Rahab. What was it that saved, rescued Rahab? Was it Joshua's command? Was it the spies who loved her? Was it the scarlet rope hanging from the window? It was none of that. Because later again, the writer of Hebrews says, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Scripture declares 
There's one thing that saved Rahab the prostitute. It was her faith and her demonstration that God, you are the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. And in that moment, she surrendered her past and her future to the God of Israel that loved her. Why? Because you are more than your past if you'll surrender your future to God. Rahab discovered her past didn't define her. Her past didn't disqualify her. She decided, I am going to be spared, and God's one day going to use me in extraordinary ways. This is also in your outline. I love this. God uses rescued people to rescue people. The reason that I'm a part of this church, the reason so many of us are a part of this church and so excited about this church is we are a family on a mission to rescue people. God uses rescued people to rescue people. Something else in your outline. When you finally let go of your past, I hope you will today, it frees you to experience the favor of God. If she would have held on to it and said, this is what I've always been. I'm a Canaanite woman. I'm doomed to destruction like all of Jericho. The weight of uh, angst of Jericho being doomed would hang heavy on her head. She was so immoral and so illicit and so dark and so depraved. But could there be a better example of God's transforming grace and freedom than the story of Rahab of Jericho? Here was a woman whose shame was covered, who became a part of the commonwealth of Israel. Because if you read on in the Bible, and history records this, she ultimately married a prince of Israel named Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N, Salmon, like a salmon, but with an O, Salmon. Salmon ultimately married her, and her famous great-great-grandson was King David, the king of Israel. More than that, this is what blows me away about the gospel and about grace and about the message of freedom and the message of hope. I don't know how low you feel. You may be lower than Jericho, the lowest city in the world, even as I speak. You may feel so depraved and so notorious a sinner like Rahab, but in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, who in and of himself was a tax collector and who became a Christ follower, he recorded the genealogy, the bloodline of Jesus, and who of all people was included in Matthew 1 and verse 5 but a prostitute named Rahab. Later on, as we just discovered, In God's great hall of faith and fame, he throws out names like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Sarah, Noah, Gideon, and you know who else he slides in? From the house of shame to God's hall of fame, a call girl who hung out a scarlet rope from a window one day, showing that God rewards faith even in the guiltiest and most notorious of sinners. Why? Because you're more than your past if you'll surrender your future to God. And she, of all people, was so dramatically changed that she's brought into the very bloodline of Jesus. That's the staggering part of the story. She became a great, 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 great grandma of a virgin-born son, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. She failed to allow her past to define her or disqualify her. Friends, I need you to know today, our God is in the Rahab rescue business. There was Joshua, which means Savior. And there's Yeshua, Jesus, who came as our Savior. Our great God has an extraordinary way of working through some highly unlikely people. He chooses, instead of giving Rahab a scarlet robe, providing a scarlet rope hung out for her future freedom and favor. For those of you who don't understand the symbolism, early on in the Bible, remember Adam and Eve, they messed up and chose the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the systems of right and wrong. And they, they suddenly felt naked and afraid. So they, they, they just kind of faked it out with some fig leaves and they didn't work real well. They would blow in the wind and stuff like that. So God said, uh, uh uh-uh, that's not going to work. Something's got to bleed. So he killed, he killed an animal that didn't deserve killing, bled it out, and took the skins of those animals and covered Adam and Eve. 
later when the angel of death is getting ready to come upon Pharaoh and all those families of Egypt. God says, you go to your doorpost and you put the scarlet blood of a sacrificed lamb a prize lamb, and you put it on your doorpost, and when the angel of death hovers over, it will pass over you. Jesus' cousin John is baptizing, and as he's baptizing, he, he says, behold, look, the lamb of God, that's the lamb of God, that guy right there, he's God's sacrificial lamb. He's the one He's the substitute that notorious sinners are going to need one day. He's the scarlet rope that's going to come from heaven to us. That's him. Look to him. Look at the life he lives. Look at the death he'll die. One day, he's going to be raised to life. That's the Lamb of God. Here's the most staggering thing about this story. And it hit me yet again. This, I wasn't supposed to do this talk today. I had another talk that's going to be next week that you don't want to miss. But on Wednesday, God said, uh-uh, you're doing this one, and you got 18 more hours of study. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk about surrender, right? I better surrender my time. Here's what staggered me in the story. I am Rahab. Don't look at me like that. So are you. We are notorious sinners. And when we admit that, this is some bad news. I'm a notorious sinner, and all of God's wrath against my sin is going to come crumbling down one day, unless I'm willing to surrender my life to this God who loves me. So the bad news is you're a notorious sinner deserving wrath and hell. The good news is Several thousand years ago now, God saw who you were and who I was, and he decided to hang a scarlet robe out of heaven for you and me, and his name is Yeshua. He's the savior of the world, and he longs to be your savior. You can get past your past. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some effort, but you're going to have to trust and obey and surrender. You're more than your past if you'll surrender your future over to God. All over this room, can I pray with you and for you about that? Our heads are bowed right now. In a moment, we're going to be taking communion, and I want us to be ready. As you think about your past, what an incredible, incredible reminder today of the transforming grace of the gospel. And some of you, you're Christians already, you know it. God knows that Christ lives in you, but you're feeling low. Some defenses have come up. And even in this freedom journey, there's been a few rocks uncovered, some truths that come out from your past, and it's hurt a little bit. Did you know what? That means you're on the right path. Don't doubt that. You're on the right path to freedom. It, it, sometimes it hurts before it gets better. So, Father, I pray for all my friends on this journey together. And I rebuke the enemy of our soul, the evil one who'd come against us in this journey to freedom. But God, what a great reminder today that, that all that stuff that's been dredged up, the shame, the blame, some of the stuff, the wounds from our past, that doesn't have to define us or to disqualify us because you've given us grace and forgiveness through your son. So God, would you free someone up who's been stuck Lord, what should have taken two weeks has taken 40 years. But God, in a moment today, would you send your Holy Spirit to free them up, to give them favor as they fully trust the situation that's so overwhelming to them over to you. Help them lay down the walls and the defenses as you come into their life in a fresh way. There's someone else here today. God brought you here not by accident or happenstance. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Not next Sunday, not tomorrow, not someday aisle. Today's the day where God is hanging a scarlet rope from heaven and his name is Jesus. You need to stop blaming yourself. 
Stop blaming other people. Stop blaming your circumstances. You need to look for a future, and God's given you one. If you'll trust and obey and surrender your life to him, here's how. God, I know what I've done. Rahab knew what she'd done. It was notorious and well-known. God, I know what I've done. I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry. Thank you, God, for sending a scarlet rope named Jesus to live a life I couldn't live, a perfection, to die a substitutionary death for me, to absolve me of all of your wrath against my junk and my past so that I could be raised from the dead and had life like you were, Jesus. And I want life, and I need life. So Jesus, I come to you today for life. Give me a future and a hope. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Thank you for forgiving me, changing me, and making me new. In Jesus' name I pray.